Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the first of what we hope is going to be a long series of what we're calling co-op chats. My name is Vince Marchese. I am the marketing manager here at the Davis Food Co-op in Davis, California. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody that's here today for joining us. Um, a couple just general housekeeping rules right off the bat. As you'll notice, I am wearing a mask tonight. Uh, that is because we do have another employee here in the room with me. So we're going ahead and abiding by the mask rules for that. So I do apologize in advance if it is a little tricky to hear me, but I will try my best to project uh, so that everybody can follow along. Um, as you will see, for everybody that's attending, there is a Q&A section. So the Q&A section, as it's going on throughout the night, feel free to pop in there and ask some questions. We are going to hold all questions until the end of the evening. We have set aside a little section towards the end of about 10 minutes where any questions you might have will get addressed. We'll try to get to all of them, but depending on how much time we have and how many there are, we will take it from there. And then, um, yeah, really just want to encourage you to uh, soak all of this in. I want to, off the bat, thank all of our panelists that are going to be joining us uh, in a little bit after I do a little bit of speaking myself here. Um, and I, I just really want to express how excited we are to be able to start something like this, uh, especially during co-op month. Although there's only three days left of co-op month, we did it, we got this here at the end. Um, really just wanting to celebrate what co-ops are at their core and how they really are um, going to be, you know, put into different communities as you'll see today. Everybody that we're talking to comes from a different community. We have mainly grocery co-ops, but we also have a coffee cooperative as well, a farmer cooperative uh, in the coffee realm. So really exciting mix of uh, different personalities and backgrounds that we have today and can't wait to talk a little bit more about it. So really what we're going to focus on today is to start is you might be asking yourself, what is a co-op? And uh, I'm sure as the other co-ops can attest to here at the Davis Food Co-op, that's one of the biggest questions we get. A lot of people, when they hear the term co-op, they hear about ownership or membership. That's something that they can be a little weary of because they're not quite sure what it is. So really what we want to first explore is what a co-op is. I'm just going to give a very brief uh, explanation of what that is. Something that is cooperatively owned is really you just need two or more people. And the way that they started is if you really think about early human civilization, those were cooperative societies. Everybody kind of had a fair um, skin in the game, so to speak. Everybody had equal ownership. Everybody was contributing to the whole. Um, and, and really bringing together their resources, pooling their resources, um, so that everybody in um, you know, the group at that time was able to uh, be successful with everything that uh, everybody else was bringing. But the idea of a cooperative as we know it today really started to manifest in the 18th century. Uh, and where that came to be is when people started moving into cities. So traditionally, when you have people living on areas that were you know, easier to grow your own food, and now you're moving into these cities, you don't have that same ability anymore. You really need to work with the people around you to pull those resources together. And a lot of times making it cheaper for people and more accessible. So that was kind of where what we know as a cooperative today started to be founded. And really where a lot of us, especially grocery co-ops, where we were kind of really molded was uh, in the US in the 1960s and 70s, really being born out of the counterculture movement. And the counterculture movement had this idea that really wanted to reshape, you know, some of the ideals of capitalism and what that looked like, especially when it came to big corporations that had distant shareholders that were profiting. Uh, they really wanted to reimagine how they could work with their local community uh, to build something together that benefited everybody within the community rather than large corporations. So really with that same mentality, the Davis Food Co-op was born. Uh, we were born in 1972 uh, by a group of 10 households, and they were all UC Davis students that were counterculture activists. Um, like I said, they wanted to reimagine what the food system in the city of Davis could look like to make it more accessible for all of the members that would then become part of what was to be called the Davis Food Co-op. So that's a really brief overview of what a co-op is. I hope that that kind of explained it for anybody that um, was still unsure of what a co-op is. And really what 
it has become today is an international network of different cooperatives. We just have a few of them here today that abide by seven principles. And I'm gonna kind of go uh, through those one by one and let you know about the seven principles that all co-ops really abide by uh, at their core. So we got a little slideshow here for you. So as you'll see, the first one there is voluntary and open membership. So anyone can join a co-op. There's no discrimination based on gender, social, racial, political, or religious factors. Um, it is something that really is both, like it says in the title there, voluntary and open. So you do not need to be a member, what we also refer to as an owner of the co-op to be able to shop at the co-op. Anybody can shop here. It is completely voluntary if you want to um, buy into the co-op to become an owner. And it's open for everybody. Like we said, there's no discrimination based on who and who cannot be an owner. The next one is democratic member control. So members control their business and they decide how they want to run and lead it. So the Davis Food Co-op, as all co-ops do, has a board of directors. And our board of directors is voted on by the owners of the co-op. We have an election each year. And an important aspect of that is that everybody that's an owner in the co-op, no matter how much money they put towards it over the years, gets one vote, all the same. Everybody has equal power in that regard. They elect the board of directors who then helps influence the day-to-day -day operations um, at the co-op by hiring a general manager and overseeing them. The third one is member economic participation. So members invest in the co-op and that means that members and not distant shareholders like we talked about get to benefit from a co-op profit. So that comes with better product selection in the store for us, for instance. It also comes with what could be patronage refunds. So if we have a profitable year, we can actually give money back to the owners of the co-op. The next one is autonomy and independence. So co-ops are individually owned and governed by their communities. They don't compromise their autonomy or democratic member control for any reason. So there shouldn't ever be a business decision that a co-op makes that goes against those, those core fundamental values that each respective community um, wants from their co-op. Education, training, and information. This here says that co-ops provide education, training, and information so their members can contribute effectively to the success of the co-op. And really that's where it's incumbent upon things like this um, for us to put things on and educate our, our owners so that they can become a more active part of the co-op. Next here is cooperation among cooperatives. Another thing that we're doing here tonight, you know, co-ops believe that, that working together is the best strategy to empower members and build a strong co-op economy. So this is definitely that. This is cooperation amongst a few co-ops that are getting together uh, to really strengthen what we believe is a robust co-op economy. And then the last one is concern for community. Co-ops are community-minded. They contribute to the sustainable development of their communities by sourcing and investing locally. They are a, an entity that is owned and operated by people in the community, so they understand the need to give back. And that is where the concern for community comes in. And so as you see there, those are the fundamental principles that really all co-ops internationally abide by. From there, and what I'm really interested in talking about with the other co-ops tonight, is how do those principles get applied into what we're all doing on our individual scales in our communities? For instance, the Davis Food Co-op, we took those core principles and we created an end statement. And this end statement is really this ideal goal of what we do in our operations on a daily basis. So I'm just going to read that to you very quickly as well. The Davis Food Co-op exists to serve as a community store and gathering place for current and future owners so that they have a thriving cooperatively owned business, access to healthful, local, and high quality food, a store that makes environmental sustainability a priority, and staff who are valued, educated, and motivated. So as you see, there's a lot of uh, carryover from those co-op principles that we then took and made specific to the Davis Food Co-op in our community of Davis. And with that, that's really what I kind of want to start jumping into with our panel tonight. What we're going to do first is just introduce you to everybody. So I'm going to start shooting it over to all the panelists that we have today so that they can hopefully introduce themselves, who they're representing tonight, what they do for their co-op. And so um, let's go ahead and get right into it. 
First up is the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op. Hi, I'm Jolie uh, from the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op and um, I have worked for the co-op for over 15 years. I started in the marketing department um, doing cooking demonstrations as a marketing assistant um, and going to outreach events and doing cooking classes and um, all different kinds of things out in the community, doing outreach events, talking to the community about who we are, what we do, um, and just kind of being being friendly in the community. Um, we also, I also have done member events. I've pretty much done everything there is to do in the marketing department besides the graphics. That's not my, that's not my forte. So everything in the education department I've done in the last 15 years, working with, with members and, um, and stuff too. So um, one of the other things I do um, that I really enjoy, I'm going to do a class tomorrow is I teach um, a product knowledge class to our new staff. And it's part of a whole uh, immersion week for our new staff where they do all kinds of training. Um, but I get to do the fun part, I feel like, because I get to talk about the store and um, all the different products we carry and all of the, we get to do tastings. We've had to change it quite a bit with COVID, but um, it's, we get to introduce our new staff to all the great products that we carry and why we carry those products and, um, and about our customers too. So that's, that's pretty fun. And that's, that's me and the co-op. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jolie. I appreciate that introduction. Um, and it's good to hear that you're getting to do some of the fun stuff over there. In fact. <laughs> Next up, we have Briar Patch Food Co-op. Gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> so my name is Michael McCary, and I am the store operations manager here at Briar Patch. I'm also like the turkey promo person here at the store. They promoted me as a turkey, and so I'm presenting myself as a turkey. So here I am, a uh, turkey. Uh, but I started in 2009 uh, as a utility clerk and I got trained in all the operational departments. I got to go around and help everywhere I could and uh, started focusing a little bit more on facilities as well at that time. In 2011, I became the front end manager where I got to spend five glorious years up there uh, helping the front end and the customers. Uh, at that time, I also wanted to expand upon my expertise and I became a consultant with at the time was CDS was CDS Consulting now Columinate. Um, I spent about three years working with that fine group of people, and in 2016 I became the Assistant Store Operations and Customer Service Manager. I nick nicknamed myself the Awesome because um, I felt I was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and then uh, earlier this year in February I got promoted to the Store Operations Manager. And uh, as a welcoming gift, uh, I was presented with a pandemic. And so I've been playing, uh, playing that role for ever since. <laughs> yeah, um, Briar Patch has been around since 1976, uh, a few years after Davis there. Um, similar story where it was opened up by a small group of people, about eight, uh, actually Quakers uh, came together, pulled resources and looking for natural healthy food at that time. Um, since then, uh, we've moved into this location. We were able to purchase this property about five years ago. Um, we're operating out of about a 9,000 retail square foot facility, doing about $37 million in sales. So that's kind of Briar Patch. Whoa, thank you, Mike. I'm not sure what I like most in the room that you got going on there between the clock. <laughs> or the Giants banner you have in the back. Right. It's all good. It's all good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that intro. Next up, we have a new co-op that's on the horizon in the foundation starting phases here. Cultivate Community Food Co-op. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Paula Schneezy, and I'm the founder of Cultivate. Yep, we're, we're the babies here. Um, so I moved to Benicia, my family and I moved to Benicia back in um, 2013. And um, I was stunned by the lack of food choice 
in the Benicia Vallejo area. Um, and I didn't know that I was a foodie until I left the Berkeley area. So, um, cause it was just normal there. Um, but only 30 minutes away, our, lo our local food choices, they're, they're almost nil. Um, and people might think that, you know, well, we have a Raley's, there's a lot of choice there. Um, but, you know, is there? I mean, so, so I'm talking about, um, you know, local food choices and, and organic that's not necessarily named organic, labeled organic, but it's that way because you know the farmer, you know how they do their, um, you know, how they farm. So, um, so I was also interested, I just wanted to get excited about food again, right? And, and, and learn about foods that that I don't even know about and get excited like, oh, what is that you're buying? What, what do you do with that? Um, Cause there's so many different kinds of foods in our area and different cultures that I wanna learn about. So I got to think there has to be other people that kind of feel the same way. So in 2015, um, I, did, I decided to do something about it. Um, you know, without knowing anybody in the community, I thought, if not now, when? If not me, who? So I just I just stepped up, right? And so in January of 2016, um, I presented a short video that the Food Co-op Initiative um, developed called um, "Can We Do This?" It's like a 12-minute video and for communities to find out if they can do it. So. Um, so I showed that in January and 65 people showed up. So definitely we had some interest. So, um, so since then I was just, you know, moving along, getting to know people, come on board, teach them. Oh, by the way, I went to um, the Food Co-op Initiative. They have this conference, a national conference every year called Up and Coming. And that year, it was the last year it was in um, Indiana. I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, this cooperative community is amazing. I mean, it was just so much energy, so much fun. It's like, you know, just people sharing and just, just the positive energy. And I'm like, okay, we can do that in our community. If other communities are doing that, we, we can do that. So with all that energy and learning, um, I got people together and we incorporated in 2017 in July. And um, last count, we had 332 owners. We were on track for 500 by the end of this year, but then the wheels came off the bus, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so um, that's, that's Cultivate Community Food Co-op. Awesome. Thank you, Paula. I appreciate that introduction and definitely can see the passion that you have. And I think I speak for all the other co-ops in the building and across the world right now that we, you know, we know that that passion is there and you're going to be a very welcome part of the co-op family. And what a great region to introduce a new co-op to. Uh, my mom is from out in that area, so I know it pretty well and definitely can attest to the, that being a perfect area for a new co-op. So thank you for that. And then last but not least, we have a non-grocery co-op, the only one that we have tonight, and that is the amazing Pachamama Coffee. Well, uh, good evening, and thank you all. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> all right, this is, a, this is a great panel to be a part of. My name is Thalian Tremaine, and I am the uh, co-founder, CEO of Pachamama Coffee Cooperative. We're based here in Sacramento, but we uh, started in Davis um, about 15 years ago. We started uh, basically in a garage in Davis, selling some coffee to the Davis Food Co-op. Um, but to step back a moment, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, originally from the Midwest, and uh, I studied business and economics in undergrad. I went into the Peace Corps in Bolivia and I wanted to, to help farmers and, and folks uh, on, at an international level. And I came back to the United States, I studied business, I earned an MBA, and, uh, but still really wanted to find a way for business to 
the better better help people and have have more impact on a global scale. So a little bit of my background. Um, I started up with Pachamama around almost 20 years ago, actually, when we started. So I, I've been there really from the beginning with Pachamama in terms of a concept and finding the initial members and uh, really, so I have a very unique experience, I, I guess, uh, sometimes a difficult one and an interesting one, but you know, starting a, a global co-op from, from uh, the very beginning, seeing it through to where we are today. Uh, today, we, we've got five members in five different countries, Peru, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, and Ethiopia, that collectively we represent um, over 200,000 family farmers. And these are small scale coffee farmers, uh, people really that live at the bottom of the economic pyramid. And uh, we've got a roastery in Davis. We have a, a national wholesale account, uh, wholesale business, I should say, selling to retailers and food cooperatives. Uh, we've got a uh, pretty good e-commerce direct to, to consumer business. And um, in the last five years or so, we built uh, three local cafes. So we're kind of a vertically integrated coffee co-op um, owned by farmers at origin, really so that they could ultimately um, make enough money to stay on the farm. And that's, it's about sustainability, primarily from an economic point of view, uh, but also socially and environmentally. And, and unfortunately, most small scale farmers really don't make enough money to, to continue farming coffee. And, um, and so that's why we, that's why farmers themselves really organize this business in order to, to, to control their own destiny, just like we're hearing from our other members. And it's really something that's a, some other necessity. Uh, or, you know, this was something that farmers needed to do the, for themselves and they for, for a very long time were looking for ways to organize themselves so that they could add value and begin to sell a finished product to places like Davis Food Co-op and Briar Patch and uh, hopefully a lot of other food co-ops around the country. Uh, so great to be here tonight. Thank you. Right on. Thank you, Talon, for that. And I uh, love bringing it full circle how the, uh, uh, this was actually a quiz question we asked on our Instagram recently for a Pachamama giveaway we were doing was where was the first place that Pachamama was sold and it was here at the Davis Food Co-op. So for it to come full circle and to have, uh, to have the, the new location that opened up right down the street again, love it, you know, and, and amazing to see everything that Pachamama has done since the foundation and definitely uh, seeing the growth as time goes on to get into other co-ops as well. So from there, I have kind of our first question for the panel today. Um, I'm really interested to know, you know, as I kind of introduce those co-op principles at the beginning of this and then describe, you know, the Davis Food Co-op end statement, how we derive that from those co-op principles. I'm really interested to know how each of you kind of incorporate the principles into maybe either your daily practices or just your philosophy overall within your community. What is it that the principles really do for each of your respective co-ops? And what about that that you take into that? Does your community really gravitate towards? A very open-ended question, but we'd love to hear how you, how you all feel about it. So we'll go ahead and start with Joe Lee over with the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op. Yeah, so like all the co-ops, we are um, we incorporate all of the principles, but I think for our community and for us, um, we, we use on a daily basis the five, six, and seven. So education, training, and information, co-ops, co co working with other uh, co-ops, and concern for community. And so um, with the education, we're doing that every single day with definitely with social media, with um, definitely, you know, just introducing people to um, uh, what co-ops are, especially during this month, during uh, co-op month, um, and then educating people about just what kinds of quality foods we carry, um, what's exciting to, you know, what, what came in today, what farmers were working with, what, um, uh, all kinds of things during with that we do, like I mentioned before, we do a very, um, we have a very robust training program within um, uh, internally with st with staff when they first enter 
and then also throughout their time in at the co-op. Um, what else we, um, oh, before COVID, we had a really, really, really vibrant um, in-store demo program where we would teach people how to cook things or just educating people about the different products we carry. So meaning to the customers um, and staff too, because uh, we have so many products that it's really nice to just be able to open something and go, look at how great this is. Look at how this, you can incorporate this into your life. Um, and so that includes bringing vendors in. And so it's nice to see Pachamama here. We love our relationship with Pachamama. Having Sochi come and do demos is something that's, um, that I just love to see her face and how she uh, interacts with the, um, with our customers. It's so great. So she, even after COVID, um, she came in just a couple weeks ago. We we have we've had like five demos happen, and that was one of the demos. So it's just it's nice to have that kind of education be able to happen in the store. Um, we get we do a member quarterly to all of our members, kind of um, all of the, with all of the you know business things that are happening, and also um, educating them on what's new with the co-op. We kind of we have a new um, general, fairly new general manager, and so. It's you know him introducing himself to our members and um, just what he's excited about. We have a lot of changes about to be happening. Um, we have a podcast that just started. We're super excited. It started this month during Co-op Month, um, and one of the um, guests was Thalion, right? So um, we're super excited about that. We're putting um, a new podcast out every week, um, and that's really exciting. Um, lots of education, sorry, that was only one of the principles. So the um, second one, uh, working with other co-ops, we love doing that. It's it, um, and like I said, especially during co-op month, we're doing that a lot. Um, concern for community, we're working, we have a lot of community partnerships. Um, we've been around since 1973 uh, in different locations in Sacramento, but we've definitely built relationships with um, so many different community partners. And um, the one I was thinking recently is we're, we're definitely working with um, uh, with some black businesses. And one, there was this one business, black owned business, um, Classy Hippie Tea is one Sacramento business that um, COVID hit them pretty hard um, to where they had to lose their um, their shop. They had a shop where they sold, sold their tea, their, um, you know, like, cold tea and also uh, tea blends. And so we've pretty much become their retail space now. So we're kind of, we're helping them in any, any way that we can to keep that relationship going. Um, and we have a food bank just right across the street. We um, support them any way we can. It's, it's difficult right now. We were doing cooking classes with them um, and with the low income community. We had a, um, a uh, what, CCK program, which is co-op community kitchen program that um, where we taught people taught low income families um, just cooking classes in our co-op as well as out in the community. Um, it's just all those things are uh, entrenched in what we do. So I think that's that's a good little well-rounded <laughs> thing of what we do. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Jolene. I'll say just kind of being from the other side of the causeway over here, we definitely look to a lot of the things that you guys are doing over there in Sacramento and really have taken notice of a lot of the things that you mentioned in there, specifically with social justice in the past few months and how, how that has become um, you know, a topic that I think all co-ops are realizing is more important now than ever. We've really been looking to you and um, seeing kind of the guidance and the, the example that you're setting for what we're doing in our own right. Um, I'll also say that the podcast that you've started um, is definitely like a, a really direct, this is a really direct result of that as well, having ideas like that. And this is what really makes it awesome to be able to work with other co-ops is to kind of build up those ideas and make it make sense for our communities as well. So definitely appreciate all that you're doing over there in Sacramento. So Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're doing things over at Briar Patch. Um, and how the co-op principles kind of work their way into your community. Absolutely, that sounds great. Um, when this question was presented to me originally, uh, the first one that came to my mind was uh, principle number seven. Um, 
and that concern for community. And for us here at Briar Patch, I think that is our definitely number one uh, principle that not only we kind of rally around, but our community definitely rallies around that as well. Uh, but our board of directors, along with our general manager, um, came up with six ends policies uh, some time ago. And all six of those ends policies were based off of the seven cooperative principles. And the six, pol six ends policies and the seven cooperative principles are wrapped into every single thing that we do um, from the leadership level on down. Um, our work plans and everything, every project that we take on ties back into those into those ends and into those cooperative principles. Um, a good example of uh, principle seven, that concern for community, you know, comes through in our um, guaranteed farm loan program. Um, we have been the number one supporter of our local food economy up here. Um, we've seen great growth. Uh, we help farmers um, with uh, organic certification. Uh, we do a lot of outreach into schools. Uh, more recently, a local nonprofit named Sierra Harvest uh, has taken on that role and we've come to partner with them uh, annually, um, giving them huge donations of money. They also work closely with local farmers, um, our local school system, uh, introducing organic foods, you know, into our, into our uh, children's diets, you know, uh, working with families on backyard organic farming practices um, and kind of really cultivating that uh, as definitely huge. The other principle that I, I, I feel that is pretty big around here is uh, principle three. And I think that's based again off of everything that we're doing around seven, that concern for community. Uh, over 80% of our customers are actual owner members of the co-op. And so they are definitely participating with that economic dollar, um, as well as you know, uh, interacting with our board of directors and really guiding us on on how we are proceeding, uh, how we are serving our community to to its best and fullest potential. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I got for that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. And Obviously, you know, kind of touching out at the, at the beginning, um, you know, understanding for those of you that might not be familiar with Briar Patch Food Co-op, if you're following along, really in all regards, you guys are kind of the uh, prototype and the example of what a successful co-op looks like and definitely get that recognition, you know, internationally for the things that you're doing that, um, you know, recently winning the NCG Customer Service Excellence Award, which is definitely in big part to what you're doing there. And it really just, you can see it in all facets of the way that you guys run your business. Um, it's definitely true to all of those cooperative principles. And obviously it's done so to the point where you get such a large portion of your customers becoming owners because they want to be a part of that. So definitely kudos to you and the whole team there. So kind of moving on now to the, the new co-op on the block. Uh, Paula, how are you guys kind of incorporating uh, these cooperative principles into the foundation over there at Cultivate Community? Um, yeah, so we use them in the foundation of creating our vision, our mission, and our values. They're definitely tied in with the cooperative principles. I am I'm so excited to do the things that Davis, Sacramento, and Briar Patch are doing. We go, we've been on tours. We, I have not made it to Briar Patch yet. I do want to go to Grass Valley, but um, touring other co-ops, the, what they're doing in their communities, it's just so incredible. And people don't understand that that is the huge difference between a cooperative and a grocery store. So at this, at this stage of our game, we, uh, when we have our board meetings, we, uh, we read them before our board meetings and just get them into our mindset. And so that, you know, the decisions that we make, and we're gonna be making some big ones here down the road, that they're always attuned to those cooperative principles and values. And this is gonna be really great because it's definitely gonna save us from mission creep uh, down the road. So. That, so we really love those principles and really, really do use them in our development. 
Awesome, thank you, Paula. And yeah, I mean, what great principles to build off of as you're kind of incorporating that into that foundation. I mean, as I kind of covered with our end statement, even there's so much carryover from these seven principles because they're so holistic and they it feels like they really kind of encompass everything that a co-op is and should be. And uh, have no doubt in my mind that, like I said earlier, with the passion that you're bringing into the co-op there and the, the base that you've already created with the people that are excited to become owners, that you're going to take these seven principles and build something that is unique to you as well in your community. So definitely looking forward to seeing how that turns out. And then last but not least, we'll throw it back over to Thalian over at Pachamama. Kind of interested to know how these uh, cooperative principles might influence what you're doing at Pachamama being a little different than a grocery co-op and what, uh, you know, the rest of us are doing. Well, sure. Um, well, you guys all got a lot of great answers there. It's, it's hard to follow you guys, <laughs> but I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I kind of agree with that comment about the starting with everything kind of starts and ends with the community. You know, that number seven is sort of number, it kind of wraps around and it's a loop, you know, so that's that overarching thing. And, uh, you know, if you think about our community, this is about farmers who were looking for really that shared a lot in common farmers from around the world that were collectively or there were federated co-ops or members themselves are co-ops and so they were looking they had that community that they were trying to unite in a way and and unite themselves as a farmers on one side and then connect themselves with the community of consumers of in consumers and so that in fact was what drove our strategy from the beginning was creating a cooperative of farmers and consumers or this cooperative supply chain, which is so why it was always been so very important for us to to connect with food co-ops around the country because we're connecting directly with consumers, and and there you have farmers and consumers pooling all their resources to work together, and 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 then it's you know so that's a lot of it the community thing, and and of course I think for our farmers too is about like accountability, you know, and since they're starting from the bottom up. This, unlike all these other things, fair trade and organic, all these other things always come from the top down. But this is a situation where farmers who are organized themselves in a sense to be, to hold themselves accountable, but to hold, hold us accountable and to be able to be transparent and accountable with our customers and show where all that money is going. Because, you know, there's a lot of money in coffee and, and, a lot, <laughs> a lot of profit being made in coffee. So it's really important that we begin to, um, this economic part participation aspect um, is something that just hasn't been benefiting coffee farmers. And um, it's, act it's actually in the benefit of both the farmer and the consumer to be working more directly together. So I think overall, this overarching sense of community of coffee and uniting like the two most important players in the whole supply chain, which is the farmer and the consumer. You know, you, you, and right now, you know, the, the farm is really struggling. So um, consumers get relatively cheap coffee and farmers make no profit. So that's not a sustainable situation. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, um, the answer in a nutshell, you know, we, we try to build a business, bake it all into the business. If you're trying to build a social enterprise, I don't think there's a better way to do it than a cooperative because it's all baked in, you know, the ownership, the control, participation, all that stuff. And then when we do our marketing, our education, that sells more coffee, which results in more profit uh, and greater benefit for those communities. So that's a kind of, it's a baked in, it's, it's, there's no better business model for impact, in my opinion. If you want to help coffee farmers, you should buy from coffee farmers one way or another, you know, go direct, you know, um, and so put your money where your mouth is. And that's what we, you know, we need to build these businesses and, and then we need to educate people, make it easy for them to make those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I, I think you kind of touched on it and it's actually a question I wanted to follow up with in a little bit here, but I really don't know if there is a better model for farmer based industry, like a cooperative model is. And like you said, coffee, especially in America, is such a there's such a culture around it. And I think that for people to really 
put their money where their mouth is, like you said, they really need to be supporting the people that are putting in the work to bring this delicious coffee that gets brought here. And there really is no better model than the cooperative model to help out the people that are making sure that we get that great cup of coffee every morning. Um, so definitely love how crucial of a part of, um, you know, the, the process that you go through um, with Pachamama is tied to those cooperative values um, for the farmers there. So we are um, running a little bit behind, so I'm going to kind of skip to some individual questions that I have for all of you. So if you could just kind of take a couple of minutes on each of these, um, they really touch on things we've already kind of talked about, but I'm interested to know a little bit more about specific questions for each of you. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Joe Lee. Um, in Sacramento, you know, kind of different from Davis, definitely, being a bigger city, I'm really interested to know how being a bigger city, how you really kind of keep that co-op community and those cooperative principles in a bigger city, you know, whereas in Davis or in Grass Valley, it's a little easier for us to, to handle that in a smaller community. How does that relate in a big city? I thought this was a fun question because I don't, even though Sacramento is technically bigger, maybe it's just the bubble that I live in of the co-op community. Um, it just doesn't seem like a big city. It's not, you know, yes, we're, we're, we're bigger, but um, the way we work is really, we do, we just treat everybody as if we are this small community. So um, one thing that we do is um, our service is just, it's a big part of our training and everything to treat everybody as welcome and, you know, and respected. And, you know, we, we're glad that they're here and we're glad that, you know, that they've chosen our co-op for their grocery shopping. And so um, our service is exceptional and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. Um, and it helps to bring, bring people in and it definitely uh, help, helps people stay. We've had, we have members who have been with us for over 40 years and um, new members all the time. And so, um, and then, you know, our, we have custom, we have 10,000, over 10,000 um, members, but not all of them are, I mean, sorry, not all of our shoppers are members. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say 80% like Briar Patch. It's not, we don't, a lot of our shoppers aren't members. And so they keep coming back. And so um, we do, you know, to keep that community, we, um, I'm, I've kind of become the face of our Sacramento co-op and um, people, you know, <laughs> it's fun, um, but it, that is a way for, that's, it, it was this kind of a strategy for, um, to let people know, who, you know, like I'm their buddy, you are, you are welcome here, you know, this is, this is where you belong and, and, and we want you here. And so, um, you know, we do giveaways and different things with social media and we, um, and uh, I don't know, we, we, we work as a small town, you know, we work as um, just keeping our, our, our community close. Um, we have, we have cooking classes that we are trying to get it, get them more going. We, we, they were pretty popular before COVID, but we, we've, we had kind of a stumbling block when, when COVID came because our marketing department did plenty of other things instead. So um, we're getting cooking classes going, but that's such a lovely, I taught a cooking class last night. It was so beautiful because I we're in other people's homes, you know, and it is such a lovely community just doing that. And that I didn't, I was nervous doing it because I was like, oh, I have to be this expert trying to teach people things. And no, it was so, it was so comfortable and so um, casual and people loved it. And so that's, that's one way I feel like we're keeping it, um, keeping it as a small community, but I'm sure I could talk for a long time, but I, you said we were short on time. So I want to let it, everybody else talk. Thank you, Jolie. I appreciate that. And definitely can attest to the uh, cooking classes too. The work we've started to do that virtually as well and starting to get that going. And definitely like you touched on, no matter what the size of the city is and Sacramento is big, you know, compared to us, but in the grand scheme of things, it really is just finding your community wherever you can find it. And I uh, can attest that being in there myself, that welcoming feeling that it still has there in Sacramento. So that's great. 
Mike, I want to turn it back over to you and something that we kind of touched on earlier was some of the success that Briar Patch has had. So how do you kind of, in a way, stay humble and, and stay true to these values, even when you become so busy and kind of all the, these accomplishments um, start coming your way? Who said we were humble? <laughs> um, so a couple things. You know, uh, Briar Patch participated, uh, we did a culture survey a few years ago. And the top three attributes that came back were caring, purpose, and results. And when I when I received that information, it resonated in me. That is, that is exactly what Briar Patch is about. We are a caring organization. We definitely have a purpose. We know our purpose in our community. And um, we're always trying to be better, to do better by our community. You know, you had touched on that customer experience survey um, and that award we uh, received. And we're very proud of that. Um, we really listen to our customers. I mean, we have so many uh, avenues for dialogue, uh, for receiving feedback, um, for engaging with our community. And we take that really to heart. Um, we practice open book management and through that outlet, we're able to really bring staff in uh, at every level and every opportunity. And we you know, constantly are talking about these different ways on how we're serving our community and really make it transparent. Like you can see the impact that everyone is having in their work uh, with that community. And it's just part of every day to day, no matter how busy it is or uh, wherever we're at. We actually, I'm sure, other co-ops are similar during the holidays. It seems like everyone's having a grand old time. <laughs> we kind of thrive at it. <laughs> so yeah, bunch of turkeys. Yeah, well, I can understand how they're having a great time when you're dressed up like a turkey yourself. You know, you're bringing the jobs <laughs> with you. So um, yeah, no, that's that's great. I mean, definitely catering to the community and listening to the people that are uh, the foundation of the co-op is really the best way to success. And so it makes sense how holding true to that is what ultimately brings that success because uh, it makes sense for the community that you're serving. So Paula, over there, um, as you're kind of starting Cultivate uh, Community, as, as that's kind of starting up now, what are some of the ways that you're introducing this new concept to the community, especially for people that might not be familiar with the co-op? Um, well, we were used to be at the farmers markets so that was helpful so that has ended so now we're doing lots of social media um and we have a newsletter that goes every month um so we're keeping that going um and then when covid hit we get we sent out a survey to our owners to say you know what do we need help with do you should we we did a food pilot and we on our website we had a um a grocery a store and we people could uh order from two farmers and um a, a, a chef she created a prepared meals and we had about 19 owners um we did it for like six weeks and um they would order things and then we would deliver them to their homes and so we said should we start that back up um or you know what should we do and um, from there, we found that they they didn't want to do that. You know, they could still get some food otherwhere and other places. So we uh, decided to help some of the small businesses. So we started a um, a video series where businesses could uh, create you know a short video, and then we would share it, send it out to our owners to promote them. We did a, a, a bingo card, and so people could. Uh, shop or read about or, um, you know, go visit a certain certain place and, and then, you know, get a bingo and then win a, a door prize, you know, that kind of stuff we've been doing since COVID. But um, so it's kind of what we're doing, we're selling a dream. So that's kind of the hard part, right? I mean, like people, you know, they're waiting and watching, right? And so uh, so our job is to build that trust, you know, it takes, it takes time, you know, we're creating a movement and movements grow at the speed of trust. So we are, um, you know, doing what we're say we're going to do. We are, um, you know, we're just trying to, you know, educating people, 
teaching them about other co-ops. Um, and uh, so sharing what you guys are doing, sharing the potential, like, you know, the Davis Food Co-op, you know, the Sacramento, we're going to be like that, you know, then they get the idea. Um, so yeah, that's the tricky part is selling the dream. But for the people that have ever shopped at a food cooperative, they're in, like they know. But um, yeah, so that, so it just, consistent messaging and just putting ourselves out there and and then and then with our owners in addition to the newsletter since covid we've been doing more regular emails specifically to our owners you know they have different messaging and um so just been consistent with that kind of thing yeah fantastic i i love the quote that you said in there the movements move at the speed of trust I, I love that. That uh, I, I don't know if that was an original one, but that was great. If it was, I love that. And I uh, really do believe it to be true that uh, you know this really is a movement and a dream that you are building right now. And that definitely does take time. But once you get those people on board with that dream and with that movement, and they want to be a part of it. They'll be the most loyal people. The people at the foundation here. So really happy to hear that that is being built there. Um, and like I said, really looking forward to seeing where it goes. And then in the, the last question I had here was for Thalion, for Pachamama, how um, do you feel that that farmer co-op model, with it being out of the country, how does that impact what you're doing here stateside in Sacramento and in Davis? How does that influence your day-to-day -day, uh, operational decisions and even just how you interact with your customers? Uh, well, that's a very good question. It, um, the the investment here is made locally a lot of times in Pachamama, but those decisions are being made on a global scale. So for example, I mean, our board of directors is literally five people, one from Peru, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, and Ethiopia. So every year we meet and our farmer representatives from each co-op will vote and they totally control how we invest the money that we make, uh, whether it's like, how much is paid in dividends, how much is going to be reinvested. And if it is reinvested, you know, how and where, and they set the budget for us for the year and that, that sort of thing. You know, last year, almost exactly a year ago, our board of directors was here in, in town and we were in Davis and we were looking at the site of what's now the, the coffee shop in Davis and that decision was made you know by the board that decided you know we want to go ahead and put some money into this cafe and as a result we've hired a number of people in Davis and we're selling a lot of coffee and in fact making more money in Davis so we can pay back the, the farmers and pay them more even more next year so those decisions you know are sort of made on a global scale and I talk about this global community that we have all these farmers and all these consumers but but what's interesting for, for Sacramento in that it all passes through here. You know, all that coffee and all those sales, they pass through Pachamama as this kind of node in the middle. And um, so, you know, I think there's been a lot locally benefited. I think there's been a lot of benefit in the farmer investment and in that farmers have chosen this area to invest in. Um, and for me, then I think what's really interesting too is, is the way, and I think you guys are all talking about the same thing actually, is it, it's, it's a, a culture, a cooperative culture that we have. And within Pachamama, we have, I think, a fantastic group of, of staff in, in, in real, like a real culture of service. You know, when you take out the greed and, and some of the, you know, the profits and all this other stuff, a lot of times you can be left with a really neat model that that brings out the best in some people. And so now we've got this cooperative culture, which I think gives us a huge advantage. I mean, you walk into our cafes and you're going to be greeted with fantastic customer service, just like Briar Patch. And that happens because our employees, our staff believe in what we're doing. And um, ultimately, it's about that integrity. And that integrity is really, you know, doing what you say you're going to do, <laughs> being true to yourself. And, and um, you know, so I think all that works together. And it, it's, um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see where Pachamama is 10, 20 years from now. Um, so I'll leave it at that. 
Absolutely, yes. Thank you for sharing. And you know, what a better board of directors to have than what Pachamama has, as you mentioned, just being from the multiple countries where you're sourcing this coffee. That's it seems like a true board that can really speak to what the best interests of all these farmers are and how that can relate into what you're doing here in, um, you know, in Davis and in Sacramento, just the visual of having them all together and surveying that site that I drive by every day on my way to work now is, is really awesome to think and to know that it really is this holistic culture that you built there that um, really benefits the, the farmers that are getting that coffee to everybody. So, um, you know, we just got a few minutes left here. So I do apologize. We're not gonna be able to get to all the questions that we had in the Q and A. I am gonna bust out the uh, handy dandy tablet here though. And, um, you know, we might have time for one or two to answer real quick. I'll just put them out. And if any of the panelists wanna jump on it, um, we will definitely just handle it that way. So let me kind of look through here very quick. So one question that's interesting is how, how do you bring products to a co-op shelf? So I don't know if anybody wants to speak to kind of how they bring in products to their, you know, this would be for the grocery co-op. Um, it's a fairly simple, I feel like. Um, it, people ask all the time because um, I feel like the co-op is a great, um, community place. So local, local products, um, people connect with, for us, they just connect with the grocery manager or the wellness manager or whichever manager and, um, and present their product, whether they connect through email or call or come in now it's mo most email, but, um, uh, and they just, they just present their product and say why they think it should be at the co-op. And we have particular, um, merchandising standards, but um, if it fits the merchandising standard and we don't have a ton of products like that product um, and it fits a particular need, then um, then we bring it in. We see how it does. We see if our customers like it. What about what about you, Mike? Pretty same. Yeah, it's a very similar process. Um, you know, just being accessible. Uh, so an individual a producer, a farmer can come in, meet with one of the department managers, um, talk about their product, their attributes, and then we just help. We actually do a lot of uh, education with small businesses, um, really helping them along with their labeling, uh, you know, uh, marketing their product. Uh, so there's a lot of education support that happens in that respect as well um, on a local level. Yeah, because I, I would say that we enjoy being the place where we have local foods. So we yeah. want to have local produced, locally produced foods. So yeah. yeah, we actually last month were able to do a focus on local. So we did a huge local sale um, that was greatly received by our community. So it was awesome. Cool. Yeah, I would say that definitely the focus on local makes that, uh, that process of getting product onto the shelf uh, a lot easier to be able to interact with the people from the local community that can, you know, bring our products in and explain it uh, themselves. And you can really have that connection. Uh, definitely makes it easier. And, and we all love our local products, um, especially out here in the greater Sacramento region. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just shoot one more question out. I know that we might run a couple minutes over, um, but let's see if I can find one more in here. Um, so there's a question about, um, you know, the podcast example that um, Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op gave, this being an example of something that's happening right now during COVID time. Um, how has it been engaging owners and the public in education or community strengthening via activities online um, or anything else you might be doing? You know, COVID has really changed everything for all of us. Um, what are some of the ways, and I can speak to it as well, um, that we've been trying to engage with uh, our community not being able to do the, the traditional way we might have in the past. I think for us, I mean, we really have started to try to make, um, you know, virtual offerings like this, our teaching kitchen classes. Um, virtual has kind of been the way that we've been doing it. We know that that's not meant to last forever, um, but I think that people are really appreciative of the effort that we've been putting forth to still get this information out there and still bring people together. I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, while we're not able to be in person right now, 
it um it definitely is still nice and comforting to have conversations with people and to be able to connect with people um, that we might not have otherwise so uh, virtual has definitely been a push for us lately and we're always looking for new ways to engage people during this time too um, has anybody else found success with with anything virtual or otherwise I mean, I talked about we do our we're doing those cooking classes too. We've also um, there's some community organizations who are doing would do cooking classes in person, um, and then they were trying to pivot, and they were like, "Oh, Sat Co-op has a kitchen, and they're doing virtual things." So they've um, there have been a couple organizations who have filmed their cooking classes to their community um, at our co-op. Um, so that's something. Um, yeah, and I appreciate this kind of format too. You know, I'm, this is this is awesome to be able to get this larger community um, talking to our our people out there too, and definitely social media. I mean, that's that's been the main thing that we've been doing. We've been focusing a lot more on social media than just doing cooking videos or doing just daily what's going on at our co-op. All right, cool. Thank you for sharing. What, one of the other questions that we had that I can definitely briefly answer was, will this be recorded? And yes, it, it is being recorded. Um, so that will be something that we'll share definitely on the Davis Food Co-op end. Um, and the other co-ops might want to share it as well, but we'll definitely have it on our website available for everybody to see um, probably as soon as tomorrow. Um, so with that, I really just want to, once again, apologize. We couldn't get all, to all the questions, um, but want to thank everybody um, from the attendees that came and took some time out of their night to join us to the panelists as well. Um, I think this was a great discussion and is really the foundation of something that I hope that we here at the Davis Food Co-op can build out to have these co-op chats and continue working with our other co-ops to give education uh, to anybody that's interested in getting it. So. Thank you, everybody, once again, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Thank so you. much.